Hello, and welcome to my presentation on the West Smelter of the Canadian Copper Company. This presentation is a photographic history of a nickel and copper smelting plant that operated in the former town of Coppercliff, located near Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. My name is Joey Bray. First of all, let's be honest. This topic isn't for everyone. Many YouTubers out there want you to like and subscribe to their channels. Well, I'm going to try to discourage you from watching this video, because the topic is really quite specific. So who should be watching this video? It will certainly help if you actually know where Coppercliff is. You should also be interested in the industrial history and heritage of the area and specifically, you should be interested in learning more about a smelter that existed for only five years, more than 100 years ago. So if you agree with these statements, then this video is for you. For everybody else, be forewarned that you'll probably find this video to be very boring. At least, that's what my wife keeps telling me. I was motivated to create this video because I couldn't find a single authoritative source that presented the industrial history of the Coppercliff West Smelter. Despite growing up in Sudbury, Ontario, and despite working as a tour guide at the Big Nickel Mine for a summer a long time ago, I knew almost nothing of the history of the first smelters in Coppercliff, which operated toward the end of the 19th century. Given the wealth of information available on the internet, I wanted to see if I could piece together the mostly forgotten history of the West Smelter. As I've already mentioned, this will be a photographic history of the West Smelter. All of the slides to come will contain pictures that I sourced from mining journals, government reports, and even postcard images taken at the time. The narration will be informed by the many articles that were found concerning the mining industry in the Sudbury area near the turn of the 20th century. The final few slides give a complete list of the sources that I consulted while working on this project. One of the frustrations that I encountered while researching the West Smelter is the inaccuracy of some of the sources. In particular, many of the picture captions were found to be incorrect. One of the most common errors is to mistake the first smelter, the East or Old Smelter, for the West Smelter. The Canadian Copper Company operated both the East and West Smelters simultaneously for a number of years, which might be the source of this confusion. But they were located at two different sites around Coppercliff. This picture of the East Smelter was taken around 1892, when it contained two square stacks. An additional third square stack would be added to this site later. This is a picture of the West Smelter. Although some authors claim that the square stacks were unique to one of the two smelters, in fact both plants, at one point in their respective histories, included three square stacks. We'll talk more about this picture a little later in the presentation. So if you decide to consult some of the sources given in the references at the end of the presentation, just remember that sometimes you need to question what is actually being said. It's always best to consult as many sources as you can and then to reconcile the information based on the photographic evidence, when it's available, that is. The West Smelter, built in 1899, was the Canadian Copper Company's second smelter located in Coppercliff, Ontario. The company's first smelter, the East or Old Smelter, had been in operation since 1888. By 1899, the East Smelter had five furnaces and three Bessemer converters. However, expansion works at the East Smelter had been done in a haphazard way. Further expansion of the site was hampered by the lack of space and the cramped conditions on the site, 
which are illustrated in the picture. Here we see the shipping yard containing skulls of furnace mat, one of the blast furnace buildings with its square stack, two of the three slag elevators with their covered slag trestles leading to the slag piles, the Bessemer or converter plant, and the converter plant's boiler with its tall iron stack. The slag trestle on the right was one of the last additions to the east smelter, and you can see how ridiculous its placement is, passing on the inside of the boiler stack and immediately in front of the converter plant. The support for the trestle even extends into the converter plant itself. So given the cramped and generally disorganized state of the East Smelter, its further expansion was deemed to be impractical. These two pictures create a panoramic view looking north toward the settlement near Coppercliff, known as the Johnson Extension. On the left is the number one roast yard. The Canadian Pacific Railway Sioux Line cuts horizontally through the image, and the only building on our side of the tracks was known as the Old Station. A siding diverged to the left of this image to service the Canadian Copper Company's works. The East Smelter is shown here. The East Smelter had been built on a flat area of land, and by the time this picture was taken, it was already becoming engulfed by the large amounts of slag that it was producing and piling nearby, which is why the East Smelter had to use three different slag elevators. The West Smelter was built in 1899 at a cost of $300,000 and was located beside the site of the former Coppercliff No. 2 mine. The site was chosen on the side of a hill to allow for the easier disposal of the slag. The number two mine was located near the top of present-day Godfrey Drive, about 3,000 feet north of the original Coppercliff mine. The number two mine began production in mid-1898 and was originally known as the MacArthur number two mine, named after James MacArthur, the Canadian Copper Company's general manager at the time. The mine's engine house consisted of two 100 horsepower boilers and two 5 foot diameter winding drums, or hoists, driven by steam cylinders. The boilers also powered an air compressor, capable of supplying 14 drills at the mine. An explosives magazine was built near the base of the hill below the rock house. The picture, taken around 1898, was captioned Engine House No. 2 Mine. The site of the West Smelter is out of shot to the right of this image, although it may not have been built yet when this picture was taken. This picture is of the No. 2 Mine Rock House looking south. The No. 2 Mine Rock House was located 375 feet southeast from the open pit mine and contained two Blake Crushers. Two skips ran laterally between the mine and the rock house. The skips were driven by hoists located in the engine house across the tracks. A tramway that served the number two mine extensions also led to the rock house. The west smelter would be built out of shot to the left of this image. This geological map of Coppercliff was surveyed in 1902. It came in two different sheets, which I had to stitch together to form the complete map of the area that is shown here. The location of the number two mines pit, rock house, and engine house that we just saw are circled in yellow. Some of the streets are easily recognized on the map, including Godfrey Drive, Serpentine Street, and over in Little Italy we have Rink, Union, Diorite and Craig. The railway line that bisects Coppercliff and which today leads to the Clarabel Mill was originally built to connect the number two mine to the number one roast yard located between the original Coppercliff mine and the East Smelter. The standard gauge track built in 1898 was 3300 feet long 
and is highlighted in blue. Note that the color code of the map itself is geological rather than topographical. It should also be noted that the map was surveyed in 1902, therefore not all of the buildings shown in this map existed in 1899 when the West Smelter was built. Both of these pictures were taken from the top of the hill near the corner of Serpentine Street and Godfrey Drive, known as the Butte, looking northeast with Serpentine Street in the foreground. The top image was taken in 1892. We can easily recognize the number two mine's rock house on the horizon in the bottom image, which was claimed to be taken in 1900. However, it's more likely that the bottom image was taken a year before, in 1899, when the West Smelter, shown here, was under construction, because the high trestle bridge that extended from the West Smelter, and which crossed over the trestle, shown in the image, hasn't been built yet. Two geological maps exist that indicate the location of the West Smelter. The one on the left by A.P. Coleman was surveyed in 1902. The one on the right was published in 1904 by A.E. Barlow, although the text indicates that it was also surveyed in 1902. Of the two, the one by Barlow on the right is the most accurate topographically. Here is Serpentine Street, Diorite Street, and Craig Street. The locations of two present-day landmarks that you can find on modern maps include Diorite Playground and the Italian Club. Zooming in on Barlow's 1902 map shows a number of buildings related to the Number 2 mine and the West Smelter. Here are some modern street names. At the West Smelter we have the Furnace Building, that is the smelter itself, a foundry, and a boiler plant with its coal shed. The railway spur that terminates just short of Cliff Street is a rather impressive high trestle that we'll see more clearly in later slides. The lateral skipway from the number two mine to the rock house is also shown, along with the engine house labeled hoist and another coal shed. The settlement atop Craig Street and which no longer exists today was known as the Crow's Nest. I wanted to see where exactly these buildings would have stood today. To do so, I compared a modern Google Maps satellite view of the area shown on the right with Barlow's map. The first step was to make Barlow's map partially transparent. I then superimposed Barlow's map on the Google Maps satellite view. Only a small adjustment of the aspect ratio was required in order for the streets and railway lines to line up almost perfectly. I then drew the outlines of the train tracks and of the buildings near the West Smelter on a third map layer. The 1902 map was then deleted. Doing so left the outlines superimposed on the satellite map, which are shown here. The railway tracks of Barlow's map are drawn in yellow. The West Smelter is located exactly where the present day number three oxygen plant is located. A 3D Google Maps view of the hill where the West Smelter and number two mine engine house once stood is shown here and where the number three oxygen plant now stands. A few of the other landmarks have also been labeled. Now that we know the lay of the land in 1902, let's go back to our earlier 1898 picture. In what follows, an inset of Barlow's map will be included that shows the vantage point of the photographer along with an ellipse that approximates the area depicted in the image. Note how the rightmost railway track passes directly in front of the engine house, and that the coal shed, indicated on the map, behind the engine house, hasn't been built yet. The number and placement of the engine house stacks also helps to date this picture 
as their arrangement would change in subsequent years. The ground to the right of the rightmost track, beside the engine house, would later serve as the West Smelter's mat yard, which was raised to permit easier access into the boxcars. There is no evidence of a mat yard in this image, suggesting that it may have been taken in 1898, a year before the West Smelter was built. This picture was taken from the trestle that leads to the number two mine rock house. The West Smelter is easily recognized by its high trestle upon which ore cars were pushed through the smelter. The high trestle crosses over the track in the foreground and terminates in mid-air, out of shot to the left. The top of the number two mine rock house and the two stacks of the engine house are visible over the high trestle. This early picture of the West Smelter depicts the original furnace building, which had room for four furnaces. The smelter would later be doubled in size. During the expansion, the rooftop chimneys were replaced by external stacks. The valley to the right is the present-day location of Diorite Playground. On the far right is the top of the hill of the crow's nest. Quoting from reference number 16, in 1899 the West Smelter was being built about 300 feet across from MacArthur No. 2 Rock House, on the brow of a hill, with ample dumping grounds for slag in the valley or draw in front. The dimensions of the new smelter building are 65 feet by 127 feet, with room for four blast furnaces. The coke sheds are built into this building on the north side. The blower house is to be a detached structure east of the furnace house, 30 feet by 50 feet, with room for two number 7 Connersville blowers, each blower driven by a 40 horsepower horizontal engine. The boiler house for the new smelter will be 30 feet by 49 feet for two 90 horsepower boilers." Unquote. The year 1899 also marked the first year of operation of the number two roast yard, which crossed present-day Cobalt Street in Coppercliff. In 1900, construction of the West Smelter was completed. Quoting from reference number 18, three furnaces were in blast, with a fourth being set up. Three Connersville blowers were in operation, and a fourth was being installed for the new blast furnace. Unquote. This picture shows the front of the West Smelter before its expansion. A water tank is visible on the left. The foundry, built in 1900, might also be shown on the left. Before its expansion, the West Smelter had only two roof monitors, which are the raised ventilation openings along the ridge of the roof. I'll try to find a better copy of this image once I have access to the library once again. This picture was likely taken from the high trestle, looking south towards the town of Coppercliff. At the time, the number one and number two roast yards were located south of the West Smelter. The number three roast yard, located north of the West Smelter, only began roasting ore in 1901. According to reference number 13, the timber rail trestle was filled in with rock removed when excavations were blasted to prepare the site for the, quote, present-day smelter, unquote. A later view of the same track is shown on the right. This picture shows the West Smelter's impressive high trestle crossing over the lower one. Note how two more chimneys are apparent behind the smelter, which might belong to the smelter's boiler plant. The Crow's Nest Hill is on the horizon to the right. This second photo accompanied the previous one. The Crow's Nest Hill is on the horizon on the left, whereas the hill on the right might be the one at the end of Union Street in Little Italy. 
The orientation of the train engine is curious, although perhaps not surprising, given that no Y in the tracks existed near the number two mine's rock house for the engine to turn around. The two previous photos were taken from approximately the same location. A less dramatic modern picture, taken from a similar vantage point on Jones Street, was obtained from Google Maps Street View. The track is still there, supported by a bed of rocks instead of the trestle. This picture was taken from the high trestle and is dated 1900. Although the smelter is out of shot to the right, many new structures appear in this image, including a raised mat yard, a new shack, and new coal sheds in front of the engine house. Note how a bend in the rightmost track has been added to accommodate the new coal sheds. A third engine house chimney has also appeared, along with the foundation for a fourth chimney behind the shack. What could be the foundry is visible on the right. We are also told that a new explosives magazine, built of logs, was constructed in 1900, 500 feet southwest of the foundry. That new explosives magazine might be this structure behind the trestle we saw earlier, although it doesn't seem very wise to build an explosives store next to a trestle. No converters were installed at the West Smelter owing to the poor results obtained from the ones at the East Smelter. In 1900, the Orford Copper Company built its Ontario Smelting Works plant in Coppercliff to smelt its own ore and to further increase the grade of the mat from the Canadian Copper Company's East and West Smelters. The Ontario Smelting Works plant was located at the foot of present-day Cobalt Street, where it joins Power Street. The Ontario Smelting Works began operations in the middle of 1901 and could treat roughly half of the mat produced by the East and West smelters. The works were expanded following its amalgamation into the International Nickel Company in 1902 and the expansion was expected to be ready by April of 1903. This picture shows the mat yard at the West Smelter. Broken mat, mat skulls, and eye beams lie in the yard. A fourth boiler chimney has been added to the engine house in the foreground, although one of the original ones, located in the foreground and on the right, has been removed. This picture, dated 1902, again depicts the yard where workers are loading mat into a Canadian Pacific boxcar. The plank leading into the boxcar illustrates that the mat yard was raised from the grade of the tracks. According to reference number three, the mat skulls were, quote, broken by means of sledgehammers, weighed, loaded on cars, and shipped, unquote, for further treatment. An extension to the engine house is being framed and is now in agreement with Barlow's map. Of interest in this photo is the appearance of two telephone poles, both having two cross arms. Given that a dynamo was known to be in operation at the Ontario Smelting Works refinery as early as 1900, a dynamo could have also been added to this site. The West Smelter underwent a major expansion in 1901, which doubled the size of the furnace building and the number of furnaces from four to eight, connected in pairs to four new stacks. The blower plant was enlarged to house two more machines, making five in all. A new powerhouse east of the other buildings, with three 100 horsepower boilers was built, along with a new coal shed. This picture shows the expansion works, with scaffolding surrounding one of the square stacks, and the roof 
going on to the newly framed furnace building expansion. Here we are inside the West Smelter. The molten metal produced by the blast furnace flows into a forehearth or settler in which the slag rises to the top and the mat settles to the bottom. Two settlers, one in front of the other, are visible in this picture along with a pair of wheeled slag troughs. The slag is guided toward the granulating trough where it comes in contact with a stream of water that has already been used to cool the furnace. The water flowing in the same direction as the molten slag carries the granulated slag away into the dump or into the slag wells. The air blast supplied to the furnace created a lot of particulate or dust in the smoke, which was captured in brick dust chambers before being exhausted to the stack. Reference number three states that the dust chambers had, quote, trough-shaped sheet iron bottoms, unquote, which are evident in the picture. Although the dust contained valuable metal, it was difficult to process because the air blast kept blowing it out of the furnace. This would be a recurring problem for the company. This picture shows the completed stacks of the expanded smelter. Note how one of them is made of iron instead of brick. The new slag elevator is also visible. Reference number 10 states that, quote, at the foot of the yard, at a point to which slag tunnels from all the furnaces are being constructed, a slag elevator has been built to run by rope drive off an engine in a separate shed 100 feet distant, and when in operation, it will be possible to reach all parts of the extensive dumping flats below the smelter." Unquote. This picture shows a view of the expanded smelter from the opposite side. The slag elevator appears to be located in a well that extends slightly from the hill. The slag piles are relatively small in this picture. Smelter Creek, which is shown on Barlow's map, is visible in the foreground with several planks going across it. This area is now diorite playground. The number three roast yard, located north of the West Smelter, went into operation in November of 1901. Reference number four states that this new roast yard was located in, quote, a swamp behind the hills, unquote, and was created so that the other roast yards could be abandoned due to their small size, inconvenient location, and proximity to the town of Coppercliff. The number two roast yard was the first to be abandoned in 1902 after its last heaps had burned out, owing to what reference 27 calls its, quote, disagreeable proximity to the town, unquote. The number three roast yard was situated where the present day railway sidings are located near the Clarabelle Mill, which explains the devastation of the landscape in that area. The closure of the other roast yards, according to reference number four, quote, permitted to some extent the growth of vegetation so that the town was once more in sight of grass and green trees, unquote. This annotated 1902 picture was taken looking north from near the number two roast yard, which is out of shot on the left. On the horizon are the number two mine rock house, the high trestle, and the west smelter. This panoramic view of the west smelter was taken around 1902. In early 1902, production at the Canadian Copper Company was halted, resulting in approximately 800 temporary layoffs, while negotiations took place to amalgamate several companies to form the International Nickel Company. The merger was concluded in April of 1902. By 1903, the output of the East and West smelters exceeded that of any previous period. 
In 1903, following the destruction by fire of the laboratory at the East Smelter, a new chemical laboratory and sampling house were added at the West Smelter. This picture shows how the slag piles have grown substantially compared to the previous pictures. Two additional flimsy rail trestles appear to lead directly into the piles. We're told that the slag was used as fill and for rail beds, and these trestles could be how the slag was removed from the piles. This picture shows the open framed front of the smelter. The 1901 smelter expansion included new coke bins supported by trestles that were built into the front of the building. The water reservoir is visible, as is possibly the foundry. The tall stack behind the foundry could belong to the new boiler plant that was installed in 1901. The two large items on the flatbed rail car resemble blast furnaces. They could even be the ones from the East Smelter, which was dismantled in 1903. Reference number three states that, quote, much of the old plant has already been removed to the site of the West Smelter, unquote. After the creation of the International Nickel Company in 1902, plans were made for a new, larger smelter to replace the former ones. According to reference number seven, the location of the new smelter was, quote, selected on a hillside about half a mile from the now old West Smelter, not far from the original East Smelter, but on higher ground." Unquote. The location is indicated by an X on Barlow's map. The site is actually located within the present-day Coppercliff Smelter complex. In 1903, the East Smelter was dismantled, and production at the West Smelter slackened after the construction of the new smelter began in April of 1903. In November of 1903, the new smelter buildings and infrastructure were nearing completion, such that installation work on the new plant could continue during the winter months. The picture on the left, looking north, shows the partially enclosed furnace building of the new smelter. Newly delivered converters are also visible inside the building. This picture, looking west, shows the new smelter with its 210-foot brick stack around 1904. The scale of the new smelter was considerably greater than that of its predecessors, with only two blast furnaces, each rated at 550 tons per day, replacing the combined 13 smaller furnaces of the east and west smelters. The new plant also included three Bessemer converters that would receive their charge in molten form directly from the blast furnaces. A new rail line from the number three roast yard to this new site was also being prepared in 1903. The Ontario Smelting Works plant was destroyed by fire in February of 1904 thereby robbing the Canadian Copper Company of a means of increasing the grade of its furnace mat. Following this, the company leased the Mond smelter at Victoria Mines for a period of six months until August the 1st to refine its low-grade mat, pending the completion of the converters at the new smelter. However, the West smelter was also destroyed by fire on the 14th of June, 1904. Despite the first tap being made in the new smelter on July 17, 1904, all production ceased until October, when the new smelter commenced continuous operations. The site of the former West Smelter is behind the dark slag piles in this picture, dated 1913, which may have been taken near the intersection of Rink and Union Streets. A lone dark building is visible behind the slag heap, which could be either the old foundry or the coal shed. The newer brick building, located beside the rock house, was identified as an electrical substation and is shown more clearly in the picture on the right. 
This picture of the Canadian Copper Company's number no. 4 steam engine has nothing to do with the West smelter, but I like the picture, and you can probably recognize the structure in the background by now. These slides list the source material that was used to create this presentation. I hope that you found the presentation to be informative. Feel free to leave a comment, and thanks for listening.